Hey guys, today we're going to a very ancient temple in a remote village called Javagal. Nobody visits this temple, including archaeologists, because it is said that the carvings here are so strange that nobody can understand them. Today, I'm going to see if I can understand what these carvings show and find out who created them. But first, I have to deal with this. I found a unique obstruction when I'm trying to enter this ancient temple, guys. Here, he doesn't, she doesn't want to move. Why? Okay. Oh, she's crying. Okay, bye. Now, from the front view, you can see that the temple seems quite small, but Archaeological reports say it has more than 1,000 carvings, and most of them are found on the outer walls. Walking around, I find this one. So here you can see something really weird. This is a box, and there's a face, there's a head on that box, and there's a hand like this, uh, and there's a head sticking out of a box. So when I look closer, I don't see one hand, I see two hands on either side of the head. And it's all put on top of a box as though they're trying to display the head and hands. But why? This is just a very strange carving. Now let's look at the nearby carvings to see if we can understand this more. Here you can see a giant figure and sure enough, you can see he does not have a head and his two hands have been cut off from the wrist up. Right next to him, you can see the smaller ape-like figure and you can see this figure holding a bow. It's an advanced compound bow because you can see the gears on both sides. The person with the advanced bow is Lord Rama and the entire event is explained in the ancient Hindu texts. The giant's name is Kumbhakarna and he gets his head and hands chopped off in the battlefield. Walking around, I find another strange carving. Now, this is one of the carvings uh, experts are totally confused about. Here, you can see two giant figures, both are ape or monkey-like figures, and one of them is holding a long cylinder-like thing on his face. Some have even claimed that this is a telescope, but that cannot be because the other end is held by another giant ape, and on top of this, there are a few monkeys, and on the bottom, you can see a couple of more monkeys. So what is the story? Now let's see if we can find more information from the carvings nearby. Let's go back a little bit and see here. Here you can see the waves and fish swimming in the water. So this is actually happening right next to water. Here, you can see an ape working on a bunch of rocks, and right next to him, again, you can see the waves with a lot of fish. On the other side of the water, you can see giants. Again, this is mentioned in ancient Indian texts. A race of apes called Vanaras were building a bridge between India and Sri Lanka. These two giant apes are called Nala and Nila, who built that bridge to Sri Lanka. And this long thing must be some material, and they're testing its strength. 
Banaras are walking on it to check if it'll be strong enough to be a part of the bridge. Even today, we will put a plank between two stones and walk on it first to see if it's durable. But these guys had superior strength. They are holding it on both sides and asking the monkeys to walk on it. Of course, making a bridge on the ocean between two countries seems like pure mythology. But just a few years ago, scientists have sheepishly accepted that such an ancient bridge actually exists between India and Sri Lanka, and it is not a natural formation. There are many strange carvings like this, but to decode them, you need to know ancient texts really well. So you need years of learning Hinduism. Maybe this is why today, most experts are not able to understand many of these carvings. Now, of course, there's going to be cognitive dissonance. On one hand, we can see carvings of apes who are doing a lot of advanced technical work. They're building a bridge across an ocean. I mean, this seems quite unbelievable. But on the other hand, we also have actual evidence of that. The remnants of that bridge itself is there. So most people cannot handle this and will choose one way or the other. Some people will completely dismiss it as fiction and others will say every detail is true. But perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. The Vanaras were very similar to Bigfoot or Sasquatch, and they coexisted with us. They are described as having incredible strength and were also able to work with human beings. Some have even claimed that Vanaras are actually Neanderthals who helped ancient builders. So how did ancient builders manage to build a bridge on the ocean? How did they traverse the ocean, right? What kind of advanced machines and vehicles did they have to go to another island and defeat a great king? Here, you can see something fantastic. This is a tank. A woman warrior is sitting in a chariot, but only her upper half is visible. The driver's legs are visible, but the woman's legs are not shown. Why? How is this possible? Look at the thickness or the height of the vehicle. The rest of her body is inside the chariot. But I'm looking to find another carving to confirm if they had these kind of tank-like vehicles. Again, here, you can see another tank-like vehicle. Here, the warrior is shown only from waist up because his lower half is inside the chariot. Of course, it's a chariot-like vehicle because you can see the horse pulling it. But what do I mean when I say it's like a tank, right? Today, if you see a bullock cart, you see people sitting on it. You can see their legs because it's just a flat bed. But if you see an army parade, you can see soldiers riding tanks, but only their upper bodies are visible. Why? Because the rest of their bodies are inside the tank. This is why the vehicle is shown with such a long chassis underneath the warrior because part of his body is protected inside. Look at the driver. You can see his legs here too, and he's sitting on a thin flat bed. But at the center where the warrior is standing, look at the height of the vehicle. This is much larger because it's an enclosure where the person can put his legs inside. Now, I'm sure people used armored vehicles in ancient times. We even have Mesopotamian carvings, very similar to modern day tanks. Here, you can see the driver is sitting on top, but the warriors are half inside, very, very similar to what we see in this Hindu temple. Again, this is another ancient carving, which also shows this warrior with uh, his lower half 
inside the tank. But as I look further and further, I'm starting to find stranger and stranger things in this temple. What is this? There are three ball-like structures, three spherical compartments. Two of them are at the lower level and one is on top of them. You can even see people sitting inside each sphere. This is a very advanced vehicle. I mean, what kind of a vehicle has three ball-like structures that can roll and each ball has people inside? This is just really strange. Now I understand why archaeologists and historians stay away from this temple because of these carvings. No mainstream expert will accept that this kind of advanced technology existed in ancient times. But let me see if I can find more carvings to confirm what this is. Look at this one. Again, a huge ball-like vehicle. It's like one large sphere on the outside, but inside you see two more balls or spheres. Inside those circles, you can see people, and two people are standing on these balls using bows and arrows. It's shown as uh, a part of the military, right? Because you can see the half-armored tank right next to it. His lower body is protected in this tank, but I think this one is a fully armored spherical tank. But how did it move? Others had animals attached to them. This one does not have any animals attached to it to pull it forward. So was it powered by some type of fuel or electricity? How did it actually move? This is definitely some type of technologically advanced vehicle that was used in war and transportation. Now, if you see most ancient temples, the carvings are categorized into different layers. You can see a bunch of levels. On the top, you will see gods. In the middle, you will see lifestyle. But as you go towards the bottom, you will almost always see animals and their behaviors. I distinctly remember as a very young child, all I could see in temples was the animals and what they were doing. This is the ancient version of Animal Planet or Discovery Channel in stone. But even today, I'm still fascinated by these animal carvings because you can see something really strange here. Here, you can see a row of elephants. These are the last three elephants on this side. And uh, if you go on the other side, we can see these three elephants. Can you see what's strange about these carvings? Maybe if I show the corner, you can understand this. These two elephants should have two heads, but they're sharing their heads because it's a corner. These two elephants have a total of one trunk, not two. In other temples, we can see how they've shown two elephants in a corner stone. This is good, but not great because the corner is not well finished. Carving two different heads means it's a waste of space. But Javagal Temple is a masterpiece, so the elephants are sharing the trunk to save space, and the corner is finished perfectly. And let's look at the next level about the elephants. Here you can see a bunch of horses. There's one horse and another horse. And then on this side, there's one horse and then another. But again, at the corner piece, the two horses are sharing the head. It actually has only one face. Think about how many people would actually crawl on the floor and notice this detail. But the ancient builders still cared that someone will notice this detail and appreciate it. Okay, we have seen the artistic talent of sculptors showing elephants and horses, but what other animals can we see here? 
here, we can see a strange animal. It looks like an elephant, but it does not have a long trunk. It has a little bit of an elongated snout and a weird blobby mouth. There's no animal like this now, but there was once a prehistoric animal called Baritherium. Experts have found fossils of this animal, but they say it became extinct millions of years ago. And the weird part is that you can see humans carved alongside this extinct animal because according to modern science, humans did not even exist when this animal roamed our planet. Surprisingly, it's very common to find carvings of prehistoric animals in ancient Hindu temples. I've shown you an elephant with four tusks in Angkor Wat temple. Again, that species had become extinct millions of years ago. I've shown you dinosaurs and many other extinct species of animals carved in ancient temples. Interestingly, Hinduism believes that humans existed for millions of years and coexisted with many giant animals. Here, you can see a plumed bird. There is a huge showy feather on its head and it has a sharp beak. But if you look below, you will be shocked because it does not have two legs like normal birds. It has four legs. This is simply extraordinary because today we don't have plumed birds with four legs. I mean, the peacock and every other bird only have two legs, but experts confirm that a prehistoric animal called Caudipteryx zooey existed and it looked very much like a peacock with fancy feathers, but it also had four legs. They say this species became extinct about 125 million years ago. And here's another strange animal. Is this an extinct dinosaur? Or is this a mongoose or a komodo dragon or something like this? What's even more strange is that some people have even tried to disfigure this carving. Now, let's look at another interesting species. Here's a female Homo sapien. You can see her individual strands of hair. And this figure is usually called Nagakanya or Vishakanya, which means venomous virgin. You can identify these carvings because you will see these very beautiful women shown with either snakes or scorpions. Here, you can see that she's holding a cobra. Apparently, in ancient times, young girls were raised as assassins to kill the enemies of a kingdom. According to this theory, from a very early age, they would be given very tiny doses of poison on a daily basis, and they will become immune to poison. This practice is called Mithridatism because it was practiced effectively by the Greek king Mithridates VI. He did take poison on a regular basis and became immune, so nobody could poison him and kill him that way. But in India, the practice is taken to another level. It's said that these women were not only immune to poison, but their body fluids would become poisonous. So if a man has intimate contact with them, he would die. Some have also claimed that they would put traces of venom in their nails and even a slight scratch would kill the man. Now, what if this girl becomes a double agent, right? I mean, what if she approaches the king of her own country and wants to kill him? How would the king identify if she's a venomous version? Look below. Of course, uh, she's wearing high heels or platform shoes. But look, one of her toes is cut. 
This is the second toe on her right leg, and it has been surgically removed, perhaps when she was young. You may have noticed that Hindu women wear a toe ring on the second toe. They still do it today to show that they are married. So it's like the wedding ring in the Western world. An Indian man would look at a girl's feet, and if she has a toe ring, she's married. And if she does not have a toe ring, she's single, and she's approachable. Now, we realize that there was a third category in ancient times. No second toe means absolutely no contact. And this surgical removal must have been done to identify them if they ever turn rogue. So if she changes sides and tries to kill her own kind, the king or any other guy from their own kingdom can identify her by just looking down and recognize instantly that she's a venomous virgin. Now, of course, you might wonder how these kind of strange practices existed in Greece and India at the same time. It appears that ancient civilizations around the globe were actually interconnected. For example, here is a figure who looks remarkably different from other carvings. He has a long, smooth hair or headdress that's coming down to his shoulders and is not wearing any jewelry and is wearing a long overcoat that goes all the way below his knees and he's not wearing any footwear. This is the complete opposite of most Indian carvings and he's holding a long cylinder in one hand and a bowl in the other hand. He's definitely a foreigner, but where is he from? Now, you can compare him with regular Indian figures. You can see a couple sitting on top of a bed or a couch. Look at their ears and neck, lots of jewelry, but what's really fascinating is what's under the bed. There is a small furniture-like thing, probably to climb on the bed. The bed seems really tall. Look at where his legs are, even though his legs are hanging down. There are two small things, and I'm sure one of them is just a container with water, like how you have a water bottle under your bed today. I've seen this uh, water bottle in many ancient carvings, typically under the seat or bed. I don't know what's the other one. Uh, is this a container for food or refreshments or something like that? Other carvings show more things under the bed. Here are four of them. The carvings cleverly show what is not next to the bed, but what's directly under the bed. Look at how they're placed inside, underneath, so you don't accidentally hit them with your legs when you get down. Now, what's under your bed or what's under your chair? Here's another very mysterious figure. He's standing in a weird position as though he's doing namaste. He looks very strange. His head here uh, looks very strange and he has this thing on top and you can see these ornaments. He's wearing the sacred thread, so we know he's Hindu, and the thread is going all the way up, and he's wearing a loincloth like a modern-day brief. At the bottom, you can see he's wearing nice anklets. Who is he? What's the story behind him? This looks very strange, right? Because you cannot fully understand what's the story behind this. But when you see the next panel, you may fully start to understand this. This is Narasimha, a god who's half lion and half human. And this person's name is Prahlada. He was a staunch devotee of Lord Narasimha. And who's getting killed here? Prahlada's own dad is being destroyed very curious and interesting. So 
I hope I've shown you some real fascinating things about this ancient temple of Javagal. I am Praveen Mohan. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I will talk to you soon. Bye.